Sam? Yeah, so, hello. I will join the session about the tracers, so we will move from S-trace, F-trace to D-trace now. <laughs> um, yeah, how do you know what D-trace is? Have you seen it? Or has anyone here some experience with D-trace from non-Linux environment? Cool. So, I will briefly introduce the D-trace itself, because it was first released in 2005. It was designed for Sun Solaris at the time, and it was the answer for performance and observability of our system, so we can support the customers of, of Sun servers and so on. Today is 2018, and the trace has been ported to various operating systems. So it is now used on Apple, Mac OS X, of course, Joan, because it is a fork of Solaris, basically. FreeBSD adopted D-Trace. We are working, yeah, it's Oracle Linux. It's a work in progress, but it's port to Linux in general. I have also seen some attempts to develop D-Trace for Windows. So, yeah, so why we need <laughs> another Linux tracer? Well, the idea behind D-Trace is it's not a Linux-only tracer. So our goal is to basically add a Linux operating system to the family of D-Trace supported operating systems, not just create another just Linux only tracer. One strength of D-Trace, uh, it can trace kernel, it can trace user space. Tracing happens directly inside the kernel at the probe time. We will talk about this later. And D-Trace has its own scripting language. It is called D. It is a basically superset of C programming language, so it's very simple and yet quite powerful. I will show it on the examples I have. Yeah, and because it was released in 2005, we have been using it at Sun and Oracle for about a decade to troubleshoot production machines of our customers. And also another benefit is there are a lot of books and documents about details already. So it is not a new technology, it is new for Linux. So I think one of the key differentiators is with D-Trace you have everything what you need. So there is no need to install external toolchain compilers. There is no need, it does not produce a kernel module so you need to load. So it is designed to be used in environments where, for example, you need to sign the kernel modules which are trusted. So you cannot just load something in the kernel. <coughs> yeah, so basically that's it. So I will briefly describe some basics of how D-Trace works. So from your user perspective, the workflow, workflow is similar to eBPF and BCC kind of tools. Well, that's because this is the predecessor of those tools. So you write some tracing script in the D language. The script gets compiled into a bytecode, which uses D-trace instruction format. So we have an in-kernel machine that interprets this bytecode. Before we start interpreting anything, we verify that the bytecode is safe, because D-trace was meant to be run on production machines. So Part of the protection is the restriction on the language side, so you cannot use loops, for example, to not create something which will stop CPU for too long, too long time. And also, we verify that the produced bytecode, because someone else can send something down the kernel, is safe to use. If everything is fine, we basically enable the probes and start processing the actions, recording the data to the tracing buffers. And our user space components periodically extracts the data from kernel and further process them as it's similar to other traces you have seen already. So the key components of the D-Trace architecture is a probe. Do not mix it with the K-probe or U-probe. A probe in D-Trace environment is just an event. It's identified by a unique tuple, which consists from provider name, module name, function, and name of the probe. We will get to this later. So it is quite abstract. Then there is something called provider. A provider is responsible for creating probes in your system. So it knows the internal logic, the implementation of how probe should be fired, what does it mean? Because our probe does not necessarily must be tied to instruction stream or something like this. A consumer is the other part of the architecture that extracts the data and processes them in user space and sends down your script. And then there is a framework. The framework is the core component that basically glues everything together. So framework is responsible for managing the probes, 
if you have a multiple consumers, it is basically subscribing the consumers to the probes and sends the data through. And yeah, that's it. So for, to give you an idea what the provider is, for example, you have a D-Trace <coughs> provider, which is just the framework itself. So there are some three simple probes. I will show you later how they are. We have a profile provider, which is able to create a probe that fires periodically on one or multiple CPUs. We have a SDT provider called statically defined tracing. So you know it probably as a equivalent is trace point in Linux kernel, or you, you as a developer statically introduce some point of interest to the code. Function boundary tracing is similar to K-probes. It basically scans the kernel, kernel modules for possible instrumentable symbols, so to build the probes out of it. FASTA provider is now oh, being in the works, so it allows you to do the same thing in the user space. At the moment, we support static instrumentation of user space binaries, but we don't have an equivalent of FBT on Linux yet. Yeah, and everything is about syscalls, so we also have a syscall provider that allows you to observe and instrument syscalls in the operating system. So how does it look like from a binary or, or, or deployment? You need to have a kernel which has a D-Trace support because we need some architecture-specific stuff directly in the kernel. And you need a set of modules. One module is called D-Trace, is the framework itself. And then usually a provider is another separate kernel module which can be loaded. And, and it adds some features of the probes to the, to the system. Then we have a libd-trace, which is the core of the user space and is responsible for compiling your scripts and talking to the kernel part, running the stuff, extracting the buffers, parsing the records, handling them. Then there is a libproc, which is a basically proc FS wrapper because it's a porting layer for D-Trace. So it adds some simplified interface on top over proc FS so it can be ported to other platforms. And then we have a compact type format helper library. I will get back to this later. So, and the last thing is the command itself you use. It is the consumer, but most of the logic happens in the libd trace. So, thanks to this architecture, you technically can remove the dtrace command and write your own command using direct the library APIs to create your own trace or integrate dtrace to your application. On, on Solaris, we used to have a Java wrapper, so you could basically use the library from Java. But I think you should be able to get D-Trace integrated to other languages like Python, Go, basically whatever that can bind the C language from, from your language. But it's not easy. I, I've tried the Go, and <laughs> it's just not, not so easy. So yeah, finally, we have some project page, which is open source. So if you want to see the sources or state of the project. We try to keep it updated. <laughs> it's not always <laughs> the latest, greatest. Um, yeah, this is where it, lives, where it lives for now. So now let's move to more interesting part, and it's actually how, how you can use the details, how it looks like. So given that there's not so much time to talk about architecture in details, I try to prepare some set of examples so we can see how how you can use it in, in real life. Or so the first thing you need to know is how the language looks like. So it was designed to be simple. So if you know org, you basically provide a list of probes identified by the tuples. It can be more than one probe because you can share action blocks with multiple probe firings. It's up to you. Then we have a predicate. A predicate is optional and allows you to write a D expression. And if the expression evaluates to true, the action block is executed in the kernel. If expression is false, we just skip it away. So it serves to allow you to quickly filter out the stuff just directly when we are at the probe firing point. Yeah, the trace actions, you will see some of them, but basically you can work with variables. You can call something which looks like C functions. And that's it. Your script is executed from top to bottom. And you can have multiple action blocks for the same probe. 
it will be executed from top to bottom. So, yeah, now to explain the things you can use. So, we have something we call a subroutine. You can think of it as a function returning a value. So, subroutine is used if you, for example, need to convert data or copy something from user space to kernel space or other way around, and it can, for example, return you point to where is the destination in the kernel, kernel space for the trace. Uh, and usually can be used in predicates case because it is a returning value. The, so you can use it to do some, some decision. The action is only in the action block. It is a statement, so it doesn't have a return value and allows you to record something into the buffers or, or basically perform some effect on the system. So the actions can be executed in two places, straight, in the probe context where we basically disabled scheduling interrupts so it will happen on spot or later in user space. In that, in that moment basically the action is not in sync with the probe firing but for some actions it does not make sense to do them in the kernel just to save CPU cycles. And also some of the actions we support can be destructive to the operating system you are looking because we have an action like panic for example if you want intentionally kill the host. So, a destructive action requires usage of explicit argument. The idea is we try to be as much safe so you avoid killing your system by some random accident, but we want you to explicitly say you know what you are doing before you kill the system. <laughs> and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to kill the system, but there are actions, for example, you can introduce delays at random places in kernel, so you can mess up the scheduling, interrupts, whatever, so there are some hard limits which can, and all the actions are blocked from you to use. So now basically we get through the language description. So you can see, well, if you try any new language, the goal is to write a hello world, so this is a hello world in Dtrace. So I'm using a dtrace provider. So you can see the full description of the probes is provider is dtrace. It doesn't have a module, it doesn't have a function, it's just begin and error probe. They are kind of special because the begin probe fires always first and is always last but before we terminate tracing so you can do some init cleanup. And error probe fires only when an action block you execute causes some error. For example, if you touch memory and would cause a page fault or something like this, Dtrace will silently ignore it and replace it like a loading value zero, but it will fire the error probe for you, so you can introduce your own handling. If you don't, you will see something like, there was an action, error on action number, div instruction number, and, and so on. So, yeah, you can see the example, we use just the begin probe, and it is not fully qualified because you don't have to, if Dtrace is able, to identify uniquely what you are talking about. There is no other begin probe in any provider, so you can just write a begin. And it has just two actions. The first one prints something. The second one terminates the tracing with the return value. So when I was talking about some actions happening in user space, the printf is a good example because the printf takes a formatting string, an optional set of arguments like you know from C language. But if we would try to assemble the final string in kernel, we would just waste CPU cycles. So what we do, we store only the arguments in kernel and then pass it through to the user space. And you, when we are in user space, we do the final string formatting and the print. So it just balances the performance between kernel and user space. So one great feature about Dtrace is that the framework knows about every available probe to you and you can list it. So you can think about that FBT is similar to K-probes. It has a, we support only return and entry points, return, return and entry points to a function. We don't support arbitrary instrumentation, but technically we can add, for example, K-probe provider and use K-probes underneath. But the great thing is you can list the probe so when you come to some random system you know nothing about it, you can at least, as a first step of debugging, take a look what's available for you to use. Well, my slide is missing. So you can do more. You, can, you don't have to list all the probes, you can just 
provide some partial specifications so you can list just a subset of probes that matches what you are trying to look for and you can look more detailed description of a probe so as you can see it's just some kernel identifier provide oh, provider name module function yeah and somewhere here is <laughs> probe name but in addition, because on, on, on Solaris it is usually a lot of about stability and backward compatibility, you have some stability attributes for every probe. This is interesting if you want to implement a script and don't want that script got broken like next day when we change the kernel. We basically give you some description how stable the probe itself is, so whether it will exist tomorrow or not, you can see private, private, Identify names means it is our private, we can change it whenever we want. <coughs> but for probe arguments, you can see it is evolving, which gives you some, there is some document about this, what, what, what are possible kinds of, of types, but basically it shows you like we will change it probably in future, but not today or on daily basis. So you can base your skip on top of it. And the last interesting thing is that for some probes, we can say you what is the type of argument a probe will get so you know what, what structure or type you can access from from the D script itself so the one of the most powerful things in details are aggregations aggregations happen directly in the kernel so and they are represented in the D language as a special variable which can use uh, multiple keys. A key can be anything. It can be stack, it can be string, it can be number, basically whatever we can make a hash out of it. And then there is an aggregating function. There is a limited set of such functions. It can be from simple counting or to something more complex, which I will show also later. Where what it does, it means whenever we record this kind of keys, we have a sort of hash table in kernel and we apply the aggregating function on top of it for every CPU and then we merge aggregations together so it is quite effective if you need to see some counts because it happens straight it doesn't need post-processing you don't have to send a huge stream of data up for some further post-processing later you can do some kind of things with this directly So, in addition to aggregating variables, of course, we have some, some built-in variables which are accessible for you in the D language itself. It's probably better to see documentation, but just to give you an idea what it is, there is a current thread variable which always holds a pointer to the running thread or task on a CPU at the moment when the probe fires. Current PS info is equivalent, but for a process. We have a timestamp, which is something like clock monotonic kind of time, so you can sort the events based on time. We have a wall timestamp, which is real wall clock time based on, yeah, on the system time. And each probe can have some, some arguments like arc0, arc9. Everything is exposed to variables. This kind of variables is not typed. If, you, if I got a few slides back, you will see there is a slight difference when I listed the probe. This is an array. So if we know the types, we expose you a variable which is an array, an argument index. Uh, the argument number is indexed to this array, so you can access it directly as a typed argument. If we don't have it, you have some built-in variables, which will be like 64-bit integers. That's it. Yes, so now we enhanced our D language skills so we can look for more advanced example so in D-Trace you do not necessarily need to write a long script so I based this on examples of so-called one-liners so whatever you see here just imagine that there is a D-Trace minus n and this is added as a string argument so it is just a one-liner yeah and you are missing some part of it I will I will explain it so basically what it does we use a profile provide profile probe which should fire all each 997 hertz on every CPU it's it's important to not to use uh, the odd number to not fight with the scheduler because typically 10 milliseconds is some time of scheduling so 
That's why the number looks weird. The probe, if you look at it in the documentation, has a two arguments, which are program counters, where argument zero is kernel program counter. Argument one is user space program counter. So whenever timer fires, you know based on which variable is non-zero, whether you are in user space or kernel space context. And then I have an aggregating variable. The variable is anonymous, so it's just and the, the name is missing, which just means details will print it at the end because it is very simple script, so I don't need to use some variable name. And I'm using two keys. One key is the process ID, and the second key, the key is the executable name. And what the part you're missing is it equals to count, so the aggregating function just bumps counter each time we see the same key value pair. So if you run dtrace this time, you will see it had found one probe, and the output will be, this is the pit, this is the exec name, yeah, again, somewhere here, <laughs> are the numbers. So it is sorted from smaller to higher, so I have a 51 for the top process. So what basically we did in this example, we created a user space profiler just with one line that monitors every CPU and accounts for every program counter in user space. So we know the top because it was my VM back in office was running just the top and nothing else. So if we just swap the arc1 to arc0, we change it to kernel profile because arc0 is, if there is no test, it's basically a test for if value is zero or not of the argument. So now we are testing whether a kernel pointer is set to something, and if it is, we aggregate, and remember I was talking about the subroutine, so the func is a subroutine which takes a pointer and give you, gives you back a string name of a symbol. So again, if you run the dtrace, you will see that this, the output is exactly the same, it gives you the symbol names, and yeah, the, <laughs> the counts, so the most often called function in Linux kernel was native safe hold because most of the virtual CPUs were idle. Yeah, one, one last thing is that a profile provider is kind of dynamic. So there is no such probe like 997 hertz. So if you ask a provider to provide you some probe, the profile one will synth synthetically create it when you request it. And if the probe exists, it gets reused because the framework duplicates the existing stuff. So this is just one interesting. So not everything must be present from loading the provider module. It can come up to life dynamically. Yeah. So now let's talk a bit about the variables itself of the D language. So we have a three scopes of variables. There is a global scope, which is kind of obvious, but you have to realize that every block, action block for any probe can fire multiple times at the same time because you have a mon more than one CPU. There is no synchronization because synchronization means matrix for locks and we are in kernel holding interrupts and schedulers, so global variables are problems of race conditions. Then we have a self-scope, which means a variable is bound to a kernel thread. So whenever you write something, you can, f in completely different probe, extract the value back because it's bound to the kernel thread. And this variable is per probe, which is interesting for you. If you have a multiple action blocks for the same probe, you can fill in something local for at the, at the first call and then use it subsequently later to short, shorten down the processing time. Yeah, global stuff is like a compiler, so if, if it is statically allocated, we have a memory for it. If it's dynamically, it's basically allocated by your first store. And whenever you set a value of dynamic variable to zero, it will get garbage collected and freed. If you run out of, or memory leak the dynamic variables, you will see something errors like, I don't have memory, dynamic variable drop, and so on. We have a support for arrays, but array even indexed by integer is always associated because it's based on this dynamic variable stuff. So to get quickly to the types, D is a superset of C. We are not using dwarf because uh, debug info is not always installed on production machine. It can be big, and dtrace historically is based on CTF. CTFs are smaller, 
because at kernel build time we deduplicate the dwarf to create a small description of CTFs and we either put them in a kernel modules or or have an archive next to the kernel which is shipped in RPM so we have a this way type information or at least some subset reasonable for details always available on production machine so if I come back to the profile provider and just again change the aggregation you can see I'm using the built-in variable which is current thread which all has a type because we have a type system and I can reference it which means now I'm basically picking an internal member of the task trust from Linux kernel and aggregating by name so it is profiler that shows you the names of threads that have been seen on CPU <coughs> yeah given the time constraint details are so many options like I bet we probably run out of the alphabet the lowercase and the uppercase but there's no problem we have a minus X so a compiler you can provide a key equals value you can change a lot of things and interesting one is the buffer switching policy by default we have two buffers one is being recorded one is being extracted ring policy basically overrides the buffer again 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 and for example you can extract it from crash dump so you can let the machine die load it up and look what was the few things before the disaster but on Linux it would need to change the crash or other tools so it's not not on Linux lazy attach is basically the problem with the astrace conditions like if a probe doesn't exist you get an error if you do the lazy attach option it means we will compile the script and run it anyway and when the probe appears in the system we enable it and start processing your stuff yeah so speculative tracing <laughs> sometimes sometimes you need to record for example function arguments and decide to keep the results only when it returns error, error. Which, which is quite hard for a tracer to solve it so in D-Trace the speculation tracing allows you to speculatively store something aside to different set of buffers and later decide whether you commit or discard the value depending on the, for example the return value you can commit if it is an error then we will copy your temporary buffers to the main one and it will appear to the tracer in user space yes so given that I'm quickly work on D-Trace is not only about the tracer because there are well-known statically defined probes across many operating systems so for example you can see this is a probe which is a logstat provider for Linux kernel for every adaptive mutex acquire so what it does this one liner it collects all stacks counts them so this is the stack that was the hottest who was successfully acquired mutex during the time I was running this one liner the best thing is it works on macOS and Solaris too because we add the SDT providers in the same way so that's the point that's another part of our work is to create it is to create it to, to really add Linux to the other family of operating systems here is another equivalent but this time we are using a TCP provider so for every receive TCP receive event in kernel we aggregate now now you can see there is a type argument I don't have the details here but it allows you to get a source IP address and you can see we use a different aggregating function now it is quantize which basically creates a exponentially of power of two sized buckets and uses its argument and increments count in each bucket it fits so you can see I was at the time just done a parallel SSH to my machine so this was some slight traffic and you can see I have a one one packet between one kilobyte and two kilobytes but most of them were like 32 to 64 so you don't have an exact size but you see some histogram or, or how or distribution of the values it's very useful for various IO stuff and also this is printed for each address in the aggregation so if I would have a multiple power connection you would see different source IPs with the different histogram inside it so now a different example typically from from the support case like someone wakes you up and just say hey something's going on with my machine tell me what it is <laughs> 
good. You don't know the machine, you know nothing about the environment. So what DTH is very good at is to narrowing your viewing field so you know where to focus. So again, still I'm using one-liners. I haven't write any single complex script. Well, yeah, this is a bit risky, but basically this script instruments every kernel function entry point. And I <coughs> use the built-in variable. As I said, the probe is a tuple. So we have a built-in variable which can you access, which allows you access to the part of the tuple of the probe definition, which is quite effective because each time the probe fires, you know what is their name. And we aggregate it by the module where the probe resides. So I just run it for a while, terminate, and boom. Surprisingly, VM Linux is, yeah, well, biggest candidate you can't see, but it's like 700 thousand times has been hit something from VM Linux. So the next step is, okay, so what the kernel is doing, and we just restrict the FBT probes to the kernel itself and start aggregating by the, the function. Yeah, you can use wildcard, so you can use something like VM Linux uh, asterisk, or if you leave it empty, details will match everything. It's, it's just a wildcard, so it, this matches every entry symbol from the kernel itself. And we aggregate by the function, which is exactly the, the missing point in the probe description. So what you get, you find out that this is the hottest function called in the kernel. Yeah, well, this is, <laughs> this is something I have changed recently because I moved from interrupt handling to log free algorithm. And the result is this will be always the hottest because we, look, we are looking in the kernel itself. The machine was idle. so. Let's take a look for the string compare because someone was calling string compare like 12,000 times. So your next question is usually, who, who, why? Why are you calling string compare so often? So as you can see, we again narrow down the FBT description and start aggregating based on stacks. So this is just the hottest stack, which was at the top with the highest number. And you can see we are doing some security context to sit comparison, which is probably based on string compare. But most importantly, if you go bottom to the stack, it calls from open Cisco. So it is a result of a user space activity. So at this point, you need to know who the hell in the user space is doing so much Cisco. So I switch a provider, use the open probe, uh, open Cisco probe, and aggregate based on process ID and exec name. Wow, it's D-trace, and it is done <laughs> 128 times. Interesting. So what next? Keep the syscall, but we restrict it to the D-trace itself and aggregate based on the first argument of the open syscall. Because the argument lives in user space, we need to use copy in string to get it to the kernel so D-trace can work on it. So this is one way you can do or because we have narrowed the field down, you can pick your tool because probably maybe you know better than I how, what to, how to debug the stuff. And you will see that most of the time it was opening something like this. Because in the D-Trace we have a call which does P online and checks for how many available CPUs you have on a system. And that's evidently implemented by iterating over this kind of path. Ch checking for some reason 128 CPUs on my 8 CPU sized VM. If there would be a user space implemented, we could follow with the user space stacks directly from this example with D-Trace and just switch towards the user space tracing. So briefly, we are running out of time, so now the script is more complex, but every Cisco a thread does, we set a cell per thread variable T to one. When we return from the open Cisco, we set it to zero. Then we trace every kernel function for every thread that has this value set, even though it doesn't have an action. So basically, we have bracketed some execution between open and end of a syscall. And if we use minus F4 trace, it will change the printing style to show you how you entered and written from the probe. So you can see on CPU3, we start with syscall open, we end with syscall open, and this is basically everything that has been called the like code flow in between. This is another nice feature if you just want to see some part of code for execution in a kernel. Yeah, the last thing is completely different. 
like let's say you have some telemetric system you want to see fancy graphs and so on so how much reads and writes GCC and LD does during kernel compilation this is kind of limitation in the language so it is hack it is not a nice stuff but but you have to add everything four times for the read, write, and different process. But important thing is, each one second, we create something like dtrace dot gcc dot write, and use the amount of writes we have accumulated. Then I add a timestamp at the end of it and just clear the aggregation so count starts from zero. So we now have one second based numbers getting out of this, and because this is accidentally format of the Graphite database, there is, a, there is a carbon parser which understands exactly this. So I just run the D-trace with my ad hoc created metrics, pass it via pipe to Netcat and send it somewhere to database. And from somewhere else you will start seeing, here is when I started building the kernel, Yeah, and here is where the link time happened. And because kernel has like 300 megabytes and there are two, in our case, three rounds of linking, it's like here, but you can't see it. <laughs> I can show on the computer. Yeah, I know this quick round, but questions? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, are there probes for Java virtual machines as well? And are there? Uh, not yet, because they are tied to the user space. Okay. Well, if there is a USDT, then then yes. But I think on Sans Java, there is an option which forces the JIT to generate the SDT instrumented code. Okay. I'm not so sure about the Open JDK. All right. Okay. But I, I think Perf and BCC and other tools do something about it, so I bet there will be. Okay. How do you debug your decode? Well, because you can, there is an option for the detrace command, which will dump you disassembly in yeah. the diff language, which you can look because on. Can be, I guess it can be quite tricky to, to, set, uh, to write your, your decode. Well, technically, the only thing you cannot trace with detrace is detrace itself, yeah. and it's always a pain, so usually we need to read it from sources, be quite patient. If you try to access a an element of a structure that does not exist when you what, what happens how is it reported as an error in your well basically we do similar things that kprobs do so if you access something invalid we have a hooks in general protection for page fold handlers this is the kernel layer of the details and yeah actually now i'm working on on NMIs on x86 and just hell because it just ends up with random corruption of registers and you need to find something clever <laughs> No D-trace. I have a quick one. So some platforms like Mac doesn't have s -trace, right? Is there any ready D-trace script that can be used to do something similar? You mean on Mac? Yeah. Well, on, on Mac, I think... Ready to make script, I think on Mac the answer is the Xcode, because Xcode is using a lot of D-trace for the iPhone development and the right. performance measurements of your application. So I don't think there is a library of script ready for it. I just wonder if there's some simple script that it just broke system calls and put timestamps around and things like that. Well, the bubble loop for, for the example, there is a, there is a group book that will help to build the system, but what you need is to use the Cisco provider, yeah. enable everything, and right. then, and then out printf, like formatting the percent percent ULL with yeah, system based that's on the time yeah, yeah. with some time yeah. 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 So you can use the printf and use. Wait, wait, I have to write that. No one actually has done that. Or well, or because it's like four lines of code. Probably it doesn't doesn't exist. Okay. people just write it. Just write it. Okay. I, th I thought it would be something simple. And then there used to be something called. Oh, so, uh, there was used to be something called Dtrace Toolkit. Okay. Which was a set of scripts, and I'm not sure if it's maybe it's yeah. there in the example. But basically, died because the auto move of one of the auto from DJs moved to the EBPF on BCC, so he is not right. sending on BCC. So okay, well, I'll have a look. I'll try it out. Thanks. Yeah. Good talk. Come back again.